for fuel oxidation in flames, in detonation, in ignition, and all kinds of combustion problems. But I want to start the discussion not looking at the hydrocarbon oxygen system to illustrate the concept of chain reaction mechanism and at a steady state approximation. Let me start by looking at the reaction of a hydrogen with bromine. And the reason I choose this system is because this is a straight chain mechanism. It does not involve chain branching, a concept I'll introduce later. Now, it has been observed very early, beginning of the last century, is that if you put a hydrogen bromine into a reactor, and you shall follow the production of a hydrogen bromide. And if the reaction occurs directly between hydrogen and bromine, then at least initially, the rate of production of a hydrogen bromide should be directly proportional to the concentration of hydrogen and that of a bromine. Turns out this is not the case. The reaction rate, in fact, is proportional to square root of initial concentration of bromine. So either the rate law is incorrect, or this is not an elementary reaction. It turns out this is not an elementary, elementary reaction. If you think about it, you have a hydrogen, you have bromine. You want them to come together, form two chemical bonds simultaneously, breaking the original two respective bonds. That probability is too small. Most likely what happens is a single molecule that is starting from bromine dissociating the two bromine atoms, generating two radical species. That process is called the chain initiation process. Now this bromine atom will now attack hydrogen molecule. It's a linear molecule. Diatomic, bromine comes, grab it and hydrogen in the leaf, kick out a hydrogen atom. That can be visualized. And probability-wise, this process is also a lot more probable than orienting two molecules in exactly form the shape, breaking two bonds, making two bonds at the same time. Okay. Nature always opted to do single event as simple as possible. And that's exactly exhibited in this reaction. Okay, It can be visualized. Then the hydrogen atom produced in this process will come to attack the bromine now. Again, hydrogen comes, grab a bromine atom, forming hydrogen bromide, leaving behind a bromine, bromine atom, which comes back, consume one more hydrogen. And uh, let's now look at this process first. For without any termination, that is, the two bromine atoms recombine, going the backward reaction, this process will go on until all reactants are consumed. OK? All right. So that's what's known as a chain reaction mechanism. And that's a straight chain, because during the reaction process, you did not multiply the chain carrier. That's the free radicals themselves. In reality, because this is an elementary reaction, you have both a forward and a back reaction taking place. The last reaction is basically the back reaction of an initiation. That's called a chain termination. You're destroying the chain carrier. That's a radical species. Now, this, the middle step is the reverse of, which is that? This one. Yeah, sorry. It's the reverse of the second step. OK? Now, by a thermal, by equilibrium constant uh, consideration, this process is not very reversible. So we're writing this only in the forward direction. Now, based on this postulated reaction mechanism, the question is, can we now describe the one half power dependency on the bromine concentration as far as the total reaction rate is concerned. Okay. This example illustrates the origin of chain reaction. 
So the way how you do this analysis, I'll skip this image, is by writing down explicitly the rate of chemical reaction accounting for all five of them, six of them, five or six, forgot. Five of them. The production rate of a bromine atom comes from the dissociation of a bromine from reaction step 19. This bromine atom is destroyed in reaction 20F, but regenerated in the back, its back reaction, also produced in step 21, and destroyed in the last step, recombination. You write the same thing for hydrogen atoms, so those are the chain carriers. An important approximation we shall make from this point is to assume during the chain reaction sequence, there is neither accumulation nor depletion of the chain rad carrier. Why is it? Consider the following scenario. You have a bucket. That's where the reactants are. You have the product initially empty. Okay? You connect the pipe, you open the valve, it will flow down. But these are reactants, it's a product. Chain carriers by definition are intermediates. And you look at this chain reaction mechanism. This radicals must run through something in between, all right? So therefore, even though you, this thing always exists, its level will not vary as a function of time. You have equal rate going in and a rate going out. That's called a steady state. Therefore, if you monitor the level of an intermediates over time, you neither going up, now coming down, at least until for a large part of the reaction process. Of course, not in the very beginning, not the very end. At the end, this must be completely depleted, forming more products, right? That's the concept of steady state. Already. And if you do that, essentially you are taking both rates, assign them to be zero. And steady state has a one more important property. That is, typically this applies to a very large flux going in, but also a large flux going out. There is no net accumulation. That is a reference to the total flux. What it goes in is 1,000 and 1. What it comes out is 1,000. So the net rate of accumulation gives you 1. One compared to the original total flux is 0.1%. In comparison to the rate, in this case, DHBR, ET, the accumulation rate over here is negligible. So steady state usually applies to the difference between two large fluxes. Okay. And indeed, you have some producing it, some destroying it. We're just saying they are at the same rate. When you do that, you can have two equations, two unknowns, you solve them. What you get is a steady state expression for bromine atom and a hydrogen atom expressed in that algebraic form. <coughs> and then you can calculate the rate of hydrogen bromide production, substituting the chain carrier concentration by the steady state expression, and you get that. As you can see, when you account for a free radical mechanism, rather than direct reaction between the two reactants, you reproduce the square root dependency on the bromine concentration. Observe the experiment only. It is this type of analysis led us to believe that Many gas phase reactions at a high temperature are driven by chain process. Okay. Then, the system in which you find 
hydrogen and bromine is not explosive. In the case of a hydrocarbon fuel, or in the case of a hydrogen and oxygen, the system is explosive. So something else is going on. So what is the something else going on is essentially chain branching. A hydrogen bromine system is a straight chain. Hydrogen oxidation is, however, follows a branched chain. Now, to understand the chain reaction mechanism, the best way to do that is this. This is actually an old story, a legend. If you look at a chessboard, how many grades are chessboard? Eight, right? So the inventor of a chess was to be rewarded by the king. And the king asked, what do you want? He said, that's all what I need. He gave me one grain in the first degree. <coughs> and in subsequent grain, double it. That's two, four, and eight, and so on. And it filled till the 64th grain. That's easy. How much is that going to be? Well, we all know at an end, this is 2 to the power of 64. OK? Taking each grain to be 1 milligram. 1 milligram times 2 to the power of 64 is probably all the crop ever produced by human. Now, we don't know the fate of the inventor of chess, but that illustrated the principle of the chin branching. It starts from something totally, totally insignificant. But soon enough, after tens of the cycles, we're going to an explosive behavior. Therefore, you start with one radical, seemingly innocent, through an occasional, very rare event of a bound dissociation. But once you start with one, quickly it becomes two. Two becomes four. Ten steps later, the whole thing is burnt. That's chin branching. And that's explosion. Already. What is responsible for this chin branching in hydrogen oxidation, as a matter of fact, in all hydrocarbon oxidation, is due to the presence of hydrogen and oxygen. Okay. If you look at oxygen, what is the ground state oxygen? It's a triplet. It has two impaired electrons, as a matter of fact. Okay. For that reason, it's a reactive. And if you think why human or living things can exist on Earth, if oxygen behaves like nitrogen, it won't be possible. Because you won't have any metabolic, metabolic activity exist. The fact that the molecular oxygen is a triplet biradical, yet it's still stable enough, gave rise to everything that we see, as a matter of fact. Oxygen, because it's a triplet, it can sustain a reaction reasonably fast with the hydrogen atom. The result is that it produces a hydroxyl radical and an oxygen atom. Those are free radicals. Okay. So in combustion, how many of you have run sensitivity analysis for any of the problems that you've dealt with? A few. When you run a reaction mechanism, you, well, this days, the standard approach that you often see in papers submitted to combustion of flame is you have to provide a sensitivity analysis. Or otherwise, the reviewers will give you a hard time. Okay? Sensitivity analysis is all about what you wish to predict. In this case, for example, if you wish to calculate laminar flame speed, you take a natural log of flame speed you take a derivative with respect to a particular rate constant. So if you get a large value, it means that particular rate value impact your flame speed. 
predicted. If this value is zero, that rate constant doesn't matter. It either means this reaction is too fast, it's not a bottleneck, not rate limiting, or it's too slow, not contributing to the total heat release. All right? Only those in the middle that matters. All right. If you have down sensitivity analysis for most of the hydrocarbon system, what you usually find is it's always most sensitive to this reaction. If it's the most sensitive, it means this is the bottleneck. The bottleneck. What is the combustion system, oxidative system is waiting for? Waiting for radicals. Give me more. So in combustion chemistry, this is the rate limiting step. And important to know that as far as the rate is concerned, I said this is actually a slow reaction. But it's the most critical reaction. That's where the bottleneck is. You can do this reaction faster. You're going to get a faster combustion. If you can kill this reaction, you'll kill the flame. Okay? A straight chain mechanism is impacted by loss. So where does it, is this initial radical come from, hydrogen? Well, Unlike a bromine, in the case of a hydrogen oxidation, it comes from the direct reaction between the fuel and the oxygen itself. Can you see it down over there? I know. This is not this. Oh. I'll move a little bit over. It's, I think, at the control. Oh, good. Thank you. That should be good. <laughs> oh, it stops on its own. <laughs> That's okay. I'll, I'll, yeah, I have to bother you to push the button again okay. to get it done. <laughs> the initial free radical comes from direct reaction between hydrogen and oxygen. The reason for that is that both of this molecule have very large bond energy. It's not easy to dissociate. <coughs> The result is that when they collide into each other, oxygen being triplet diradical, it steals in a hydrogen atom, producing hydrogen atom and hydrogen peroxyl radical. Now you have the hydrogen atom to stop, goes into this process, you get the two radicals. So now H2, the hydroxyl radical, will find that the fuel itself produces water gives you enthalpy, raise the temperature. In the process, regenerate you this hydrogen atom. Okay. The oxygen atom is by far among H, OH, and O atom. The oxygen atom is the most reactive. Okay. You read the combustion literature, sometimes it tells you, well, when you look at the reactivity, look at the OH. The real reason isn't because <laughs> OH is the most reactive. OH is, in fact, a lot less reactive than H atom and O atom. The reason we say OH is because that's something we can measure. It's not easy to measure O atom. As a matter of fact, O atom is excessively reactive. What it does is regenerate an OH and hydrogen atom. Now, that's a second chain branching step. The OH comes back here, produce another hydrogen atom. So in that process, you start with one hydrogen atom. One cycle later, you get a three. You get a three back. OK? That's one. That's two. OH goes back, reacting it again. That's three. One to three, three to nine, nine to 27. Do that math. You, don't, you go to the second row of this chessboard, you get an astronomical number. All right. And this issue is also related to a number that we need to know. Okay. Typically, at an atmospheric pressure, 1,000 Kelvin, how many molecules do we find in one cubic centimeter of volume? How many? All right, let's do that. 
if you have one atmospheric pressure, okay, you remember that the concentration is pressure over gas constant over T. You have one atmosphere, you have 1,000 Kelvin. In the atmosphere, Kelvin, if you are to getting a molar concentration expressed as a mole per cc, then the gas constant is 82. Don't believe me? Just start from 8.314, redo the units, you'll find it's 82. All right? So this number is about 100. If you have 100, it's 10 to the negative 5 <coughs> mole per cc. Correct? Then you multiply this by Avogadro number. What you get out is about 10 to the 18 molecules per cubic centimeter. All right? Again, another side point of footnote. You know those of us who did the PhD in the late 80s, early 90s? There's one thing that was not available to us. Copy and paste. <laughs> that time, we have to use a mainframe computer for any computation, and literally, you have to walk across the campus, grab this thick stack of a printout, not on A4 letter or on whatever we use. It's those big printer. You bring the whole stack back, you open it up, you copy the number into your notebook. So the result is we know numbers. Kinetics is a quantitative science. Next time you do copy paste, do yourself a favor, look at that number. The number is important, okay? Often when I review papers, I find mistakes in the number you express. A lot of time is because it's so obvious. You know, if you say my temperature is 10,000 Kelvin, that's obvious to you, something's wrong, right? But when it comes to molar concentration or other reaction rate quantities, I see often mistakes. It's because you don't follow the number. Follow the number. So 10 to the 18 molecules per cc, reference to 1, 3, 9, and so on. All right? And you need to get about 10 to the 15 radicals to get the system kickstart explosion. So try this out on a piece of paper and calculate how many steps you need to get there. How many? Come on. I'm sorry? So we do this by 3 to the power of n is equal to 10 to the 15. What is n? So it's 15 divided by log 10 base to 3. So it's about a 30, 40. OK? Now, if you do shock tube measurement, and you're following hydrogen explosion. What you're basically trying to follow is this about a 30, 40 step of radical chain branching. Very small number of them. And if you follow a laminar p mix, the flame, well, in flames, you have, diff you have diffusion that smooths things out. But still, you are doing that many steps. Out of a total, about a 10 to the 18 molecules per cubic centimeter. That's remarkable, you think? OK. If you appreciate now this power of chain branching mechanism, you'll be able to understand explosion. I guess for historical reason, I want to talk about this explosion, and then I'm very sure many of you had this thing. Thank you. That's literally the experimental device. 
It's not schematic, no, it's a schematic, but that's how simple that experiment is. You have a glassware so immersed in an oil bath. You can control the temperature of the oil bath. And you subsequently control the pressure. Therefore, the pressure is controlled by two separate valves. You have a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen flowing through the tube. By manipulating these two valves, you'll be able to manipulate the pressure inside. Okay? You have two independent thermodynamic properties or thermodynamic condition you can play with. One is pressure, the other is temperature. The chain branching nature and a different branching nature causes this rather complex behavior. And your goal is to say, give me a pressure and temperature combination. I want to know whether this hydrogen-oxygen mixture is explosive. Explosive means, well, I turn my, I fix the, my oil bath temperature. I shall adjust the valve now. I measure the pressure. I wait a few seconds. Do I see light emission from that glass bulb? And you now can construct the explosion map. On this right-hand side, this red curve, explosive. On the left, it's non-explosive. It's an inverted S-curve. Okay. And you would expect that if things are simple, you should get a one monotonic line moving from here down there, qualitatively. Why? Reaction rates are proportional to concentrations. And the concentration at a given temperature is proportional to pressure. Therefore, erroneous, beha erroneous behavior states that the higher the temperature, the greater the rate constant. You compensate in these two effect states that you should have a line something like that, explosive, non-explosive. So the question then is, what causes this behavior? What causes this behavior? Because of radical chain termination. Okay. This behavior is called, this can be explained, that can be explained. This middle range, the second explosion limit, and if you look at a number, this is in terms of a bar, and this is about 0.1 atmosphere. <coughs> Is that right? Yeah, that's right. It turns out that even though hydrogen can directly react with oxygen to form two radicals, the reaction can happen in a different way. And you simply allow hydrogen to stick to oxygen. After all, oxygen are triple radicals, it has two impaired electrons. It is perfectly comfortable to form bonding with hydrogen ion itself. So it is the competition of this versus that that gave rise to this complex behavior. That is, the higher the pressure, the greater the rate of this reaction. Whereas rate constant for this reaction is independent pressure. Okay, so why is that reaction rate constant pressure dependent? It's pressure dependent. I'll go back to talk about nature of unimolecular reaction, or rather recombination reaction. They are all the same thing. Is because think about that. You have the hydrogen ion bouncing into the oxygen molecule, slam into it. You slam into it, and you do see this attractive part of potential energy trying to lock hydrogen atom into this oxygen molecular structure. But that's an adiabatic system. Energy is conserved. You have that much translational energy relative to each other, of course, slamming into each other. This translational energy must be transformed into rotational energy and the vibration energy. The result 
is a very jigglish HO2 molecule. It's jigglish because it's a vibration and rotationally excited. Okay? Even though this partition, even though this translational energy can be absorbed by the complex for a finite period of time, it comes in, this energy translate, transformed into OO vibration. Half of it, the other half it retains. Some of it goes to rotation. All right? That prevented the hydrogen ion in the next oscillation to be kicked straight out. If O2 is a monoatomic species, then there is no other internal modes, in fact, to absorb this translational kinetic energy. So the next thing that must happen is comes in, goes out. The fact that oxygen molecule has an internal degree of freedom, allowing this species to stay around. Stay around for a little while because inside of this molecule, the energy, vibrational energy, is randomized. But statistically, at some point, the OO stretch or the bending is going to give some energy back to the HO bond. When that happens, it can kick the hydrogen back out. What do you hope for in this case is that the excited HO2 molecule has enough lifetime, lifetime that's long enough, perhaps a picosecond, perhaps just a few femtoseconds happen and allow for a third body to come. This can be the nitrogen in the system. It's cold. Colliding into it, remove that internal vibration energy away. Now the species, the complex gets stuck. Stuck below the exit part of the potential energy well. It'll take a couple more collisions before the species sort of stabilize, okay? And subsequent collision essentially move the species in terms of energy, internal energy, up and down. And if you follow that statistics many times, at the end, what do you get? Boltzmann, Maxwell Boltzmann statistics, okay? So I'm introduced the concept here. That statistics, in other words, if you look at, you <coughs> flip a coin. You can take one coin, flip one million times. You get half head, half tail. That statistics is identical to flipping one million coin all at the same time. Again, you get half head, half tail. Expected value, right? So if you follow the energy fluctuation due to collision of a species in a system, the statistics is identical to taking a snapshot of the whole system, okay? And that distribution shows that. So this concept is important when we go to something called RPM theory to explain at a more rigorous level how does pressure impact the reaction rate constant. For that, let's leave this diagram over here, and now I need to explain so-called the Lindemann mechanism. Yes, please. So, is the diagram proof in general for uh, other kind of systems? Is this like a batch reactor? Like you have like this is a batch reactor, yeah. So, would that be true for like a plasma flame or another kind of system where diffusion plays a role? The fundamental reaction mechanism is identical. What it exhibits in a particular reacting system is becomes very different, okay? You can observe some of this behavior in a flow reactor, but in flames, depends on pressure. You can operate in a different region, but as far as uh, 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 that goes to the laminar flame theory that is determined by heat release. As a matter of fact, it's very forgiving about detailed mechanism. We'll talk about this later, okay? And this is explosion limit. Exposure region, it's more or less a time independent observation. Which, by the way, why did we have to make that observation? That observation was made 
hundreds of years ago, a hundred years ago, is because we have no fast diagnostics to measure rate of progress. Okay, all what you know is for the given time I can do this observation, does this thing explode or it doesn't explode? That simple experiment already tells us a whole lot about the reaction process. Okay. <coughs> Go back, going back to this issue about unimolecular reaction. Now one thing I wanted to tell you is the following. The nature of unimolecular reaction and a bimolecular reaction <laughs> recombination is the same. They are all facilitated by a third body. In a case of you wanted to do in a forward direction, you need to stabilize this excited complex due to the collision of A and B forming that <coughs> excited complex. In a back process, you need to have a third body to excite this molecule such that it will have internal energy poking above the potential energy well. A frog down in the well, you have to kick it up before it can jump up, so to speak. A frog jumping into the well, you have to shoot it to let it come down. And at a molecular collision, but that sounds a little crude, so don't do that instead. <laughs> so at a molecular level, it's all because of a collision. But the forward array constant and a back ray constant in this case is also related to the equilibrium constant. And in this case, Kc is Kp times Rt to the power of one. Okay? So the right hand side is again a function of temperature and temperature only. It has no dependency on the third body. Its density is pressure. Therefore, this equilibrium constant does not tell this dynamic. So whatever the dynamics you see in the forward and the back must be canceled out leading to an equilibrium constant that's a function of T only for this case. And it's for that reason that the discussion I'm going to give when I do this for the back reaction here is for the forward reaction is identical. Okay. Now, Lindemann postulated that to explain this dynamics he said that if I have an A molecule initially in some sort of a mean energy state, probably somewhere around the middle of this Bar Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, sits well below the barrier with which you can break this chemical bond if it is a camp bond breaking you are worried about. You must be excited. Excited due to collision. Okay? And not all collision will excite it. Some of it will, by chance. After all, how frequent do molecules collide in this room? Talking about numbers. Do you all know? All right, let's roughly estimate this. We said that the molecules in this room typically move at about a 300 meters per second. Where the number come from? Well, take half kT, we have this now, right? For each translation of motion. That's the kinetic energy. The internal energy is kinetic energy here. So that's half of mv squared. Okay? okay we don't this stuff. Forgive me for now using CGS units. If I take Boltzmann constant, 1.38 times 10 to the negative 16, erg per Kelvin, times 300. And that is equal to the mass of an atom, say hydrogen. Right, let's make it Roughly 30 divided by Avogadro number times V squared. Okay? 
And I can guarantee you that this V is about, about 30,000 centimeters per second, or 300 meters per second. What's the lengthy path of the gas? Ambient pressure. Make it a room temperature. 70 nanometer. What is name free pass? Lambda is 70 nanometer. It's a roughly the distance at a one atmospheric pressure between two air molecules, oxygen or nitrogen. And there's also more rigorously, this is the distance a molecule must travel, the mean distance between two collisions. It's a dynamic system, they're not static. That's about a 70 nanometers. So all the magnitude, you look at a collision frequency, 70, get away out. You have 30,000 centimeter over second divided by 70 times 10 to the negative 7 from nanometer to centimeter. Okay? Let's make this one, let's make this one. Let's make this 100, excuse me. So this is because 10 to the negative 5. This is also 10 to the negative 5. It's about positive 5. You take these together, it's about 10 to the 10. One over a second. The conclusion is, order of magnitude, uh, every second, a molecule in this room would collide with the other molecule. 10 billion times, 10 billion times. So collision is very frequent, okay? And out of this one billion times, you gotta be able to find a hot molecule somewhere, lying at the tail of Maxwell Boltzmann energy distribution, okay? All right, so same thing like you go to a market you're politically neutral, but you bump into people, 10 billion of them in a second. They gotta be a couple of radicals. <laughs> they wanna have a revolution. <laughs> Already? That's the same thing. Now, you form this excited species. This excited species now are able to dissociate, break itself, rearrange itself, okay? On the other hand, when you get too excited, want to have a revolution, well, you might find a friend, a partner, or calm you down. That happens, another 10 billion of them, okay? So this excitation, the excitation is nothing more but molecular collision moving a molecule and its energy almost randomly weighted by Boltzmann energy distribution going up and down. And if it happens that you get to the high energy end, you're able to poke above this potential energy to get out. Give it a chance, it may get out. And there's a finite frequency associated with that. All right, that's the dynamics of unimolecular reaction. To write this dynamics kinetically, we show again assuming steady state. A steady state is to say that the probability for the reaction is so small, in fact, it doesn't affect the concentration of this excited species capable of reaction. It stays the same. You have dA, dT produced from excitation, you get rid of it from the excitation, and a little leak going out, that's the real reaction process. You apply steady state, you make this rate to be equal to zero, you get this expression, okay? Now you can determine the concentration of a steady state uh, excited species capable <coughs> of transforming itself to something else, and that's given by that expression, obviously it must be proportional to its concentration itself, that's A plug in into the net rate for unimolecular reaction that's observable, you get this expression. This expression can be uh, 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 
shown that the net reaction rate constant, that's what's observed, is expressed as an algebraic expression of individual rate constant. Okay. Look at this expression a little bit. What you find is when the pressure goes to zero, okay, approaching zero, the M value, that's the molar concentration of a gas in a system, that's P over RT for a finite temperature, M goes to zero. When M goes to the zero, this term becomes very large. That kills this term. All right? You see the negative one exponent here. Flip this thing over. What you find is that at low pressure, the rate constant becomes directly proportional to concentration of the gas. <coughs> Why is it? Well, very low pressure. Collision is infrequent. You keep waiting something else to come to kick you. So the number of kickers determine your rate. Okay. Conversely, if you go to high pressure, M goes to very large, one over large value is small. This term becomes dominant. Case are all these 3K are independent of pressure. Then when you go to the high pressure limit, what you get is a pressure independent expression. So now you plot what's called a K uni. That's a unimolecular reaction observable rate constant as a function of pressure or molar concentration of the gas in the system. You know that there are two limits. That's the high pressure limit independent of pressure. You have the low pressure limit directly proportional to the concentration of a third body. As the limiting case, then if you connect these two limits, what you basically have is this line. Okay? Interpret the high pressure is a very simple. Collision is so frequent, you're basically waiting for this excited species to break apart. Already. And that's the nature of a unimolecular reaction. And then if you recast those expressions, what you find is a unimolecular rate constant is basically expressed as a 1 over k uni at a 0 at low pressure limit plus 1 over that of a high pressure limit. That gave rise to this behavior. Okay. Now, when you run a chemical code, whether it's premix using a reaction mechanism, you find that some reactions are simply expressed. For example, how many of you have looked into a reaction mechanism? You did, right? You've seen sometimes reactions are expressed as H plus OH plus M producing H2O plus M. What are you explicitly saying here is this reaction is in a low pressure limit because the rate constant given here is basically K27F. The M is that M. So if you look at the rate expression, you have K27 multiplied by concentration of OH, OH concentration of M. Okay. In other instances, you find, for example, and dissociating, producing something called a PX primary dotted cell plus a hydrogen atom. When you do that, you're implicitly saying this reaction is at a high pressure limit. The rate constant is independent of pressure. Okay. Then there are cases in between Example, methane. Now in chemical expression, we have an M in a, in a parenthesis, producing methyl and a hydrogen atom plus M. And this rate constant is expressed as one simple erroneous expression. Then down below, you have something called the low with three 
Arrhenius parameters, right? And sometimes you find a troy, troy. What is that stuff? The pressure ball off. What this basically says is that for this particular <laughs> reaction, for the temperature pressure condition of interest to us, for example, wool atmosphere, lamina premix, the flame, you're right in a fall off region. That's all right here. This is called a fall off region. Therefore, you must consider both high pressure limit, low pressure limit, and interpolation of the two limits. This interpolation and a parameter for such interpolation is given by the choice form. I will talk about this a little later. The next issue. Why is that typically you look at the reaction mechanism, if you, the way how I do it is I put all small molecule reaction on the top. And the bigger the molecule is, the more <coughs> down below you find them. Okay? I didn't do this on purpose, it's just because you always start from what's called the foundation of a small hydrocarbon chemistry first and then you're building on top of it. All right? If you look on the top of the reaction model, most of the reactions are expressed as three body reaction. You go to the middle, you find that. You go to large, you get that. What is the fundamental reason? Why is when the reactants are small, they are more like a third order reaction operating in this region? When you go to very large molecule over here, when you go to intermediate size molecule, you fall into this region. As a rule of thumb, why is it? I'm sorry? Size is small, so the velocity is higher. When the molecule is high, the velocity is high, but what are you accommodating isn't the velocity. What are you accommodating is the momentum and kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the same because it's half kT squared. I'm sorry, half kT. OK? That isn't the true cause. You have more internal modes, precisely. You have no more internal modes in this case to accommodate <coughs> this incident kinetic energy. And this molecule excited live longer if you look at the standard point of the back reaction. It can live so long, it can always find a third body to stabilize it. Therefore, the larger the molecule you go, the more likely this reaction is in a high pressure limit. But if you extrapolate, you extrapolate the molecule to the size of an earth, you're always at a high pressure limit. Why? I throw a chalk onto the floor. You're always going to stick to the floor, right? That's the high pressure limit. OK? When you get to a molecule that's small enough, it has too few internal degree of freedom. The limiting case is a single atom. It has absolutely no ability to accommodate an incident kinetic energy. You always do one bounce. So in the case of a hydrogen atom, hydrogen atom recombination, you better be lucky to get there. The dynamics is a hydrogen atom comes in, and it must go back out unless there is a molecule somewhere in the vicinity. During the dynamic process of a collision, you take that energy away right on spot. You don't do that, there's no hope, it goes back up. It is for that reason that H plus H will forever to be in a low pressure limit. Are we okay with that? You're always waiting for this M to occur. And in any sequential processes, the slowest the process always win. All right, we walk out the door. The rate limiting step is the rate out of the door. That determines the overall rate of the process. The slowest always win. All right, so that explained the nature of a unimolecular reaction, except for that I have to tell you that this theory, the Lindemann theory, stated as it is, is a grossly inaccurate. All right, it, it explains the nature of a unimolecular reaction or bimolecular recombination that eventually explains the second explosion limit of hydrogen. 
But qualitatively, it's very inaccurate. I will get to statistical theory later to explain what is a better way to describe this rate. Okay. Back to hydrogen oxidation. Again, uh, this is something I feel a little inverse even to, to, to discuss, but let's go through it in exactly 30 seconds. The way how we express rate constant as a function of the temperature is typically using the Arrhenius expression. The original Arrhenius expression says if you plot the log of k as a function of 1 over t, it's a straight line. Therefore, the Arrhenius expression is given as a, the, the, the prefactor a with an exponential function that has inside this activation energy in it, so-called activation energy, divided by gas constant, divided by temperature, is negative of it. Okay. What you need to appreciate is the temperature dependency of the rate constant due to this exponential function is usually very strong for any finite value of activation energy. And we also see, if you open the reaction mechanism, typically now reaction rate parameter has this temperature exponent. Temperature exponent, if it's a positive, what you should find is if you do the Arrhenius plot, this curve should bend upwards. If it's a negative, it should bend down. Okay, the origin of this coverage count from transition state theory, we'll talk about this later. Therefore, this is called the modified Arrhenius expression. The constant in the front is no longer the frequency factor. Okay, it does not have a physical significance. Unlike the A here, it has a physical significance. When you go to Arrhenius, modified Arrhenius expression, B is just a fitting parameter. All right? In the contrary, the N may not be. N is a temperature dependency of the partition function. When we get to transition state theory, we'll get to that. But because both terms are temperature dependent, this E becomes a pseudo activation energy. It's not an activation energy itself. Okay. And the fact that you have Arrhenius kinetics, the origin of that is if you look at the Boltzmann energy distribution, we said this earlier, as far as uh, distribution of energy in molecules. Most molecules like to stay lazy. They stay down on the lower part of the energy. And then they will take an exponential dive as you start to increase the energy. All right, just like a society, most of us are pretty easy going. And then you have a few radicals, always want to have revolution. That's always on the Boltzmann tail. Sometimes they succeed. That's a chemical reaction. Right. Molecules collide each other with each other all the time. Most of the time, nothing happens to them. Okay? They come, they bounce, they leave. All right. Now, the fact that you have this tail in the energy distribution tells us that as long as I have an activation energy that lies finite, I must have a certain portion of molecules. Remember, in one cubic centimeter, I have 10 to the 18 of them. They are so always going to be some capable of, not capable, having energy above this threshold activation energy. So this tail gives us basically the exponential term in Arrhenius expression. You increase temperature, you will find more molecules to be populated at a high energy state. So comparing the red curve and the green curve going to higher temperature you can find a high population of active molecules capable of reacting. That's qualitatively this, what this whole thing is about. That gave rise to the uh, 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 possibility of, not possibility, gave rise to the validity of Arrhenius expression. The Arrhenius expression on its own is empirical. There's no physical reason why a ray constant must obey the Arrhenius law. It came about because about 100 years ago, you can only make observation over a very narrow range of a temperature. And within a small range of a temperature, typically, you find linear dependency between log of k versus 1 over t. Okay. That leads to one important issue that I again I wanted to talk about. This issue now, I've heard too many times that you cannot converge a flame, or rather flame speed. How many of you had 
trouble converging a flame by Pumis. Well, they're not that, that many. That is, they keep doing Newton or keep doing time stepping. Typically, when this problem occurs, one thing you must look at is the rate constant value. I'll tell you why. If you plot rate constant in a Arrhenius form, 300 or around 300, this is a plot 1000K over T. So 300 Kelvin, this is about a 3. 500 Kelvin is 2, 1000 Kelvin is 1. Okay? And you do most the kinetics in flame at a temperature above 1000 Kelvin, right? Number one, number two. If you were to design a reactor, if you were to measure rate constant, it is impossible for you to design a reactor that can cover that wide range of temperature. Typically, you can only cover, at the most, the southern Kelvin, like if you have a shock tube. If you have a flow reactor, this is typically is about 100 to 200 Kelvin. Okay? Keeping in mind, this is a log K. So you're also deal dealing with a chemical dynamic process over many orders of magnitude. So the time constant for your reactor can only be usually limited to within few orders of magnitude at best. So high temperature measurement is the most relevant to us. So you get a little line look like that. Over the entire temperature range, this from <coughs> data analysis standpoint is literally just a single point. Okay. Now, if this is the only thing available to you, you shall extend this to 300 Kelvin. But this is a point relative to the scale. As a matter of fact, if you're off in activation energy by two kilocalories per mole, you might as well extrapolate it down to this or down to that. Even though what matters to you for combustion purposes is only here. Now your room temperature becomes a problem. The problem yet typically occurs for the back rate constant. The back rate constant, if you remember, is a Kf over Kb is equal to Kc, and that is a thermodynamic property, independent of measurement. So if you do Kb equal to Kf over Kc, if you had it down that, then the back rate constant may become artificially too high. And it may exceed the collision limit. When it exceeds the collision limit, this is typically what happens to radical radical reactions. Artificially, you have a burner, have a cold boundary condition at 300 Kelvin, right? You're artificially sucking up free radicals from the flame. So when you run a flame code, you find, well, if I do time marching, I always see this flame kill itself. You must, when you run flame code, you often see this, right? The flame just wants to die. Doesn't matter what gas you have. The most important reason here is you have artificial rate constant, sucking up the radicals at the code boundary. And the origin of that problem is this simple Arrhenius behavior. All right. Conversely, when you develop a reaction mechanism or reaction models, if you're not careful, you go to a paper, you say, well, this paper said, well, the rate constant in this applicable range of temperature, it has a factor of 10 to the 13 energy, activation energy 10 kilocalorie per mole and to throw this into mechanism. That's very dangerous to do. If you want to do this right, you need to calculate both the forward the rate down to 300 Kelvin, and you have to calculate back rate constant down to the same temperature, you have to ask them, does that agree with what I know from reaction rate theory? If not, you could mess up 
as much as 10 orders of magnitude down to low temperature. Okay, so a good reaction kinetic kinetist know that he or she must evaluate every rate constant over the entire temperature range. Without it, you're going to be in trouble. Then for pressure dependent reaction, this thing and this line is just a slice of a particular pressure. Okay, the problem becomes even more complex. So the other thing, crew for a reliability of a reaction mechanism is you go inside, look at the rate constant assignment. The more rate constant that is simply is expressed by the two parameter Arrhenius expression, the more likely that it will fail under many conditions. If you do this right, typically you have to worry about the temperature exponent because intrinsic transition state theory states this must be a curve, not a straight line. Okay? So if you can write a little code, the next time you run a reaction model, a reaction mechanism, the first thing we'll probably you should do is find a way so that the ladder the chemical code to spit you out forward and back rate constant from 300 to 250. You put a little marker in the code. Say when a rate constant becomes larger than a collision frequency. Mark it. May not be wrong, but it's a cause for concern. And I don't care how many reactions you find in a reaction model. If you have more than 10 marked with that flag, be wary. Okay? Your results of a computation may well be unreliable because of that. If you find a 50, trash that mechanism. Already? And I wanted to tell you this because there are too many papers published because of this problem that you're making very wrong conclusions. Very, very wrong conclusions. It's because artifacts coming from low temperature. And you must know whether you develop a reaction model or mechanism or you use other people's mechanism. Okay? I won't name the names. I can tell you 90% of reaction mechanism out there has this problem. 90%. Trust me. All right. All right. So let's go to now hydrogen explosion problem. We wrote down all the reactions. Let me do this again. <coughs> the question is, how close? Oh. Oh, well, actually, I wanted it to be. Done. <laughs> Just to reiterate what we talked about earlier. You initiate the chain reaction sequence by directly reacting hydrogen molecule with oxygen. Produce the hydrogen atom, it does the chain branching, followed up by producing water and more chain branching two double chain branching process, okay? And our numbers. Now, the first explosion limit, I have to go up in the ladder, excuse me. Oh. That is, if I fix my temperature, I go from low temperature, low pressure, to high pressure, following this trajectory. Things initially non-reactive, then suddenly cross the boundary, it becomes reactive. Why? The reason why is the following. At a very low pressure, the total reaction rates are small. More importantly, the diffusion rates are large. And the larger diffusion rate tells me that if you have radicals produced, it has a higher likelihood to diffuse to the wall. And any physical wall, whether it's quartz, Stainless steel, whatnot, is are uh, all good radical quenchers. Okay, get to the wall, destroy it there. First thing. Second thing. By the way, why is the fusion rate increase as you decrease the pressure? We know that for a fact. Yeah. 
kinetic theory. But can you be more specific? What is diffusion? I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Larger free mean pass. Oh, low pressure, you get a larger mean free pass. So why, why larger mean free pass gives you a larger diffusivity? Lesser things to collide with the weak someplace. Ah. So in the vacuum, the diffusion rate is by definition infinite. Not infinite, it's a finite rate, but it's very, very large. Why? I have one molecule in a vast empty space. If I decide I'm going to go that way, nothing is going to stop me. Diffusion is the result of concentration gradient. In the case of a one molecule in a vacuum, you have a concentration di discontinuity, more or less a gradient issue. Okay, You start to increase pressure for fixed volume and temperature, you increase the number of molecules in a the system. Then you start to see more of the molecule coming to bump into you. So getting there becomes harder. Right? Oh, you guys understand that. You go to a party. Before people show up, it's easy to get to the beer. Diffusion rate is fast. If you do this by random motion, I'm pre pretty sure you don't, uh, unless you get drunk before you get there. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine yourself drunk before you get to the party. You're going to do random motion, trying to find a beer. Oh, it's easy for you to do it before people show up, then after people show up. Correct? All right. Diffusion rate increases as you reduce the pressure. That concept can be understood. Diffusion is because of random motion of the molecules. OK, collision slow you down. Therefore, diffusion diffusivity is inversely proportional to pressure precisely for that reason. All right. I talk about this, you will see by Thursday, I'll bring in transport theory. And those concepts that are down at the end, you realize it's all about molecular collision and the outcome of it. Okay? And when I get to that point, I'll also challenge you about your understanding of the governing equations. Those you, you took for granted, plug into premix code. How do you know the governing equation of premix code is correct? I gave you one scenario that this equation is actually wrong. I'll get to that. It's related to diffusion and a chemical reaction, but anyhow. So down the first explosion limit, when the pressure is very low, hydrogen ion tends to diffuse through the wall, get it destroyed. Okay? H plus O2 rate, being pressure dependent, is very slow, so that doesn't play a role. Okay? <laughs> Other recombination happens, it's also very slow, but the mainly has to do with diffusion with hydrogen ion. When you increase the pressure, you impede hydrogen atom from easily reaching the wall. Eventually, you're going to allow it to react more with molecular oxygen along with increasing pressure, rates increase. You cross the explosion boundary, going into this happy burning region. Pressure increases further, reactivity dis disappears. The reason for that is H plus O2 termination now becomes more dominant effectively competing with chin branching and kill the chin branching process. Okay. You go from non-explosive to explosive. The third limit is determined by recombination of the HO2 radicals. And you better ask that if I increase the termination reaction producing HO2 radical, where do this HO2 radical go? They're going to accumulate at one point. Pressure is going higher and higher. It's less and less possible for HO2 to get to the wall. And after accumulation, aren't they still radicals? Yes, they are. They are capable of recombining, forming hydrogen peroxide. Okay. Hydrogen peroxide, if you accumulate too much of it, will undergo OO fission, producing 2OH now. You have a new chain branching path opens up. So the system becomes active again. You cross this boundary back into the explosion limit. All right? Qualitatively, as you can see, the chain reaction mechanism dictates hydrogen oxidation. 
And even at this level, we see a tremendous complexity. And as for the same reason, combustion kinetics is not an easy problem in addition to the high nonlinearity of the problem. Okay. That's a postulate. We postulated everything. Let's see quantitatively our chain reaction mechanism is able to predict anything in terms of trend, at least. So the analysis goes like that. Again, employing steady state analysis, I should consider those reactions I wrote on the board. Don't worry about detail. I just wanted to tell you the thought process behind it. You have a hydrogen atom product production rate. It is destroyed by chain branching, reproduced by second chain branching of O with H2. Produced by OH reacting with H2, destroyed by just ter chain termination. OK? Well, I consider only four reaction steps. I also write out rate expression for O atom and OH. I have three unknowns. That's the hydrogen atom, oxygen atom, OH atom, OH molecule, radical in the system. I have three equations. I assume steady state for all three of them, assigning the rates to be <coughs> equal to zero. I can solve the problem. And at the end, what you basically find is combining this thing algebraically, what you find is the rate for hydrogen atom production is given as a two times the chain branching reaction rate minus one times the chain termination rate. OK? All right. The two comes from the fact from the second chain branching reaction, O plus H2. That's why it's two. That's the fact responsible for one radical gives you three in the next cycle. Now, if it's equal to zero, well, anything non-ideal things in the system, lose a little radical will cause the explosion to die. So to really make explosion possible, you have to make sure that the rate of a hydrogen production, atom production, is greater than zero. And or it must be less than zero to be non-explosive. So roughly, the second explosion limit lies uh, around these two rates being equal. Okay. From there, you can manipulate, take that, recognizing M is basically the molar concentration, and rearrange this equation for it to be at the boundary of explosive, non-explosive region, you get a molar concentration essentially equal to 2 times K4 D1, that's a rate constant of branching, divided by rate constant of termination. Okay. Empirically, we have observations made for those rate constants. Okay. And this is given here. And what you get is, plug into this expression, you find that the second explosion limit based on the chain reaction mechanism we discussed and the rate constant assumptions here, the pressure and the temperature <laughs> must follow this relationship. Okay? You plot this relationship back onto this second explosion of swimming. Excuse me, explosion limit plot as this green line. Okay? Qualitatively, quite close. We predict the slope. Quantitatively, we're off by about a factor of two, a little more. That's not bad. That's because we have not considered other reactions. We only consider five reactions in the system. <coughs> okay. What other reactions you wanted to consider? Well, that you get into the rim of reaction mechanisms or for what I said, a model. Now, Princeton owns the hydrogen-oxygen reaction model so to speak. Professor Dreyer has been spending many years developing this type of reaction mechanism, so I'm little, uh, feeling a little uncomfortable to present a one on my own here. <laughs> All right? But I'm going to do that because if you look into the detail, if you ask me, they're all the same. It's our prejudice choices for ray constants. OK? And there are certain random things built into it. But anyhow, that's what this whole thing looks like. This mechanism also included oxidation of a carbon monoxide. So it's a little long. If you only wanted to worry about a hydrogen oxidation, you go to about a 20. 20 reactions is sufficient. 
to explain it all. Uh, now, I wanted to explain item by item. I'm very sure most of you know what this are. But in case you don't know, <laughs> now it's a chance to get to know everything inside of a reaction mechanism. We describe a reaction as reactants, products, the Arrhenius parameter, that is the, the B factor we talked about earlier, actually it's not A, it's a B factor, temperature exponent, and a pseudo activation energy. And this is expressed in the union of the calorie per mole per calorie. Okay, calorie per mole, excuse me. Okay. Now, one of the things we religiously, in, in back 20 years ago, when we write a reaction mechanism and when we published, we always do it religiously. We put in reference, where did we get that parameter? The trouble was, that in order to publish a reaction model, if you have a few hundred of them, you might as well look at a two month, come up with this table in Microsoft Word, check line by line. We didn't have copy paste from mainframe to desktop. Remember that? Okay. We have to double check all the references. Already? We don't do that today anymore. We allow you to put in supplemental material. You're allowed to put a rate expression without it telling us where it's coming from. Why argument is you have 20,000 of those rates. How would you be able to do this? And that factor, that is one of the factors responsible for that many mechanism papers published today than 10, 20 years ago. We were limited by the rate at which we can make a table like that. And I can tell you how time consuming it is because I made that table. Already? Now, let me ask you one thing. If you are the reviewer, how comfortable are you with a reaction mechanism that's somewhere in supplemental material. Are you good? No, if I'm the review, I can tell you the truth. I don't look at every rate constant expression. Back in the 90s, when I get a paper for review, I actually look into every expression. I'll tell you, A35 is off by factor of five. What are you doing? I'm serious. Today, you have a few thousand. All what I know and all what I see is experimental data and some curves, agree, disagree. And when I see agree, it doesn't mean all those rate parameters you assign are correct. When they don't agree, it doesn't mean you have a bad model. What would you do? I've decided not to review any reaction mechanism paper. <laughs> <laughs> That is going to be a problem. Then if you ask me, well, I have the reaction chemistry for living for a very long time. What do I do? The last paper I published in reaction mechanism was 2004. I have not published anything since. USC Mac 2, some of you might have been using it, and JetSurf are all published on the web. And I don't have a solution. I'm going to go around about it. I'm chickening out this whole process. Where, why? If I post it on the web, then I don't have to feel guilty not providing you with source of rate parameter. Okay? And not because it's the right way of doing it. All right? You write a paper, well, don't you have to quote the numbers of your source? You do fluid mechanics, you say my viscosity is this, don't you have to quote where you get that viscosity? If you're not, reviewers will demand it. Why not rate constant? You took it somewhere. At least you have to give people the credit who come up with this rate expression. All right? So it is this branch of a science gotten to a point that a publication becomes ascientific. And you guys are going to have to solve this problem. How? I don't know. Think about this problem, okay? 
Now, not having reference for each rate constant is OK. Still, compared to the problem of you have that many rate constants, this is only hydrogen, it's small, 20 rate expressions, roughly. You go to a mechanism for n dot k. You have a few thousand. And I can assure you 99% of the rate constants were unknown. It's based on chemical similarity rule that you assign them to be equal. For a class of reaction, all share similar dynamics of potential energy. That's a valid approach. You don't have to measure or know everything. But the number of classes becomes so large, you can never do enough experiment. Enough experiment to inverse the problem, back out those rate constant. Never mind the temperature dependency, pressure dependency. So you know from your high school math class, if you have three unknowns, you need to have three equations, right? In a physical world, each equation is a physical observation that relates your parameter to the observable. Therefore, in theory, if you have 10,000 rate parameters, you must have 10,000 independent experiments, independent. If you do two shock tube experiments, one at 1,200 Kelvin with what the other is 1,250 Kelvin, those two experiments are coupled to each other. They're not in, independent, they're, they're dependent on each other. Now, are you violating the very fundamental math principle that you deal with a mathematically ill-defined problem? If math doesn't work, you all know that. Nothing works. So why are you interested in combustion chemistry? Aren't you all dealing with a mathematically ill-defined problem and a badly ill-defined problem? At a time when Dixon Lewis put this whole thing together, he put something like that in the 60s, 1960s, before all we have evolved. And he has about half this reaction. And that is a problem we can have mathematical closure. There's about a dozen parameters. Do a dozen experiments you don't want. You want more, do a few hundred. You can do that. Now you get a large field. It becomes a problem. There are too many parameters. Now your wisdom, your empirical uh, uh, knowledge kicks in. Yeah, in. If you ask many of us, they will say, oh, look, those reactions are not important. They assign anything. It's valid. It's a valid thing because reactions are sequential process. And overall rate, if that's what you want to predict, is determined by the bottleneck, rate limiting step. If you wanted to predict any flame behavior, it turns out there are just a few reactions impact your prediction. OK? The rest don't matter. They are either very fast or very slow. If you're very slow, you throw them away. If it's very fast, there's no sensitivity towards their rate parameter. <coughs> Therefore, if you're off by an order of magnitude as a guess, there's no consequence. But the problem is, how do you know beforehand this is true? This is a fundamental problem. I go back to my early question, why do you want to do combustion chemistry? Let me rephrase my question. The next principal challenge in combustion chemistry is to come out with a mathematical way to deal with this fundamental problem. Turning this problem from a mathematically ill-defined problem to something that's mathematically defined. One way to do this is going back, I wanted to talk so much earlier about quantum chemistry. An independent way to come up with thermochemical property, those are parameters, Rate constant is go to quantum chemistry theory. OK? In theory, if all of you learn how to do, use those codes, run reaction rate theory, I will be able to calculate a few hundred of them every year. OK? And a few tens of you know, a decade, you're going to have everything calculated in principle. That at least what I saw was the path 10 years ago. 
I won't give you my opinion what I'm thinking today. <laughs> but that's the reason I want you all to entertain at least some uh, an idea about playing with this quantum chemistry code, get your own opinion of what those codes can do. If you use them well, it can be very helpful. It can give you very accurate records. What is unfortunate today is there are only few people in the world know how to do this calculation accurately. The two previous lecture lecturer of EFRC, Stephen Klippenstein, is one of the best. Michael Pillen, last year's lecture, is also one of the best. I occasionally do that, but I'm only pinch hitting. Okay, to do those calculations takes tremendous amount of effort to interpret the results and do it right. Anyhow, so I want to stop today's lecture, and I do want you to fiddle with this idea of mathematically underdefined problem. And I want to tell you this is not only just a problem of reaction kinetics or chemistry. If you do turbulent combustion simulation, you deal with the same problem. Where do those parameters are in a LES model come from? How many do you have? How did you simplify the equation? All right, I'll stop here.